All right. Welcome to your new adventure, the two sample T test. We are going to um, first of all do the independent samples T, and then we'll get to the dependent samples T in just a moment. So, if you remember, in your last adventure, we had the one sample T test. An example of that would be if you asked, is the average tip smaller or bigger than normal? And let's say by average tip you mean what you earned the last um, four tables, one, three, five, and three and you're comparing that to some population information you have of five. In other words, on long-term experience, you'd expect a tip of five. So formula-wise, this is how it would work. You'd compare that three and that five, and you'd have to figure out standard um, error, and then you get a t-value. SPSS-wise, you'd plug it in like this in a tip column, just one column. You would get your um, t-value, then you'd have a significance test and in this case, since that's not below 0.05, we'd retain the, the null. Okay, so far so good. And then we add the two sample independent t test. You might be surprised to learn that there's now two samples. Do men who get tips of two, three, sorry, not, yeah, men get tips of two, three, two, and three, get bigger or smaller tips than women? Four, five, four, five. So, the, the means are going to work out to a difference of 2.5 and 3.5 and we're going to subtract from that the difference that we're expecting between the two populations which we're always going to set to zero. There'll be more on that in a second but formula wise it simplifies basically to the difference between the means divided by this new measure of standard error which is called standard error of the difference. So you would get a t value of that and if you did it on SPSS, you're going to divide the samples, divide the data into the two samples. So here would be the men, and here would be the women. And then we would plug it in. We're going to get a significance value of 0 0.003, which is below 0 0.05. So woo we're going to reject the null and conclude that um, women's tips are significantly bigger. That's probably because they work harder and do a better job. Okay. So let's work through now a full example in a little more detail of an independent t-test. Let's imagine a clinical psychologist uh, wonders if sorority students face greater peer pressure regarding body image and appearance. She hypothesizes that sorority students will weigh different amounts that's either more or less relative to non-sorority women. So we would start with the hypothesis testing steps. The first line's a little different. Now we're comparing a sample mean and another sample mean, and I'm just noting here that the two population parameters are unknown. And then our null hypothesis is going to be no difference, that mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero. In other words, if we look at sorority women versus non-sorority women, we should find no difference. The alternative is that, ah, there is going to be a difference. And then in step three, I'd set up a few um, values, so alpha is a 0.05, it's not written here, but we can assume we're doing a two-tailed test. Then you have your degrees of freedom, which are slightly different. Notice it's N1 plus N2 minus 2. That's because we have two columns. But it's a variation on that N minus 1 theme. And that would work out to 8. And then we could go in the back of the book and look up that T critical value, which would be plus or minus 2.306. Then, step four, we would calculate T obtained. Let's assume we have some raw scores where we're going to compare sorority and other. And so these are the, the weights of sorority women. These are the weights of non-sorority women. And then I went ahead and worked out by hand the means. So if I were working with a formula, it would look like this. And again, that, uh, oops, sorry, that mu1 minus mu2 is typically going to drop out because we set it equal to zero. And so then you're just left with the difference between the means divided by this standard error of the difference. You are not going to learn how to calculate that by hand. I'm assuming you can live with that disappointment. Um, we're going to just get that from the SPSS printout. So how would you set it up in SPSS? Well, we have to use two columns. And the first column is going to indicate which group we're dealing with. So the sorority group is going to be here at the top. And that one you've set in the background equal to mean sorority. And then you have the weight for the sorority women. And then the second group, the other, you put down below and um, indicate twos for them and then uh, their weights. 
So this is the thing that can mess people up when they're doing an independent t-test. You don't put it in and just do columns like this. You have to divide it up into indicating the group in the first column and the weight in the second column. One way of realizing that is each data, excuse me, each line is for a separate person. So each person needs their own line because these aren't the same people. All right. And then we can actually calculate the SPSS analysis, which is fairly simple. We just go to Analyze, Compare Means, Independent Samples T-Test, and then step two, we're going to move over the weight and move over the groups. So it should make sense to you that we're testing for a difference on weight. That's our dependent variable. You might write that there. And then our grouping variable is group, duh. And to define those groups, we have to click on this Define Groups button, and then we get this little dialog where we just indicate that group 1 is 1 or group 2 is 2. And then hit continue and it'll kick out your output. And the first output is going to be the descriptive statistics that it just tells what's going on in each group. And then this table below, oh sorry wait, and then up here um, the important thing is to see that the two means are represented here. So this, if you want to write that, that would just be x bar 1 and x bar 2. And then down below we have the inferential statistics. So the inferential statistics are the ones that help us make that hypothesis testing decision for whether or not we have statistical significance. So two things to look at. One is this first significance test, which is new. This is a special test that just tells you what playing field you're on. And you're either on the playing field where you can assume the variances are equal, or you have to assume the variances are not equal. We'd like to be on this top line, and we can be on this top line as long as we don't have significance here. So what you might write down here is, um, if this value is below, um, excuse me, is above 0.05, we use the top line. Otherwise, we use the bottom line. You see how we have a few more degrees of freedom on the top line? We like that. So assuming this is not significant, and it's not, we're going to be on this top line, and then you go to the significance test that you're more familiar with for the hypothesis, and we're looking to see if this is below 0.05. In this case, it gets close, but not quite. So we're going to end up retaining the null there. OK, what else do we got? We have the t value, t obtained, the degrees of freedom. Notice it's that n1 plus n2 minus 2 thing. And then we have uh, the mean difference. So here you could write x bar 1 minus x bar 2. And I've written this because it's kind of hard to uh, get just right. So uh, this is the standard error of the difference. And you're going to have um, it represented like this. So in your formula, you would have the difference between the means divided by this. And that gives you t. The mean difference is the same as this minus this. All right, and then step five, which we've all been waiting for, we're going to say the hypothesis was not supported. The weight of women in sororities, bleh, does not differ significantly from that of other women, bleh, comma, bleh. Again, this is called summarizing the statistic. You'll note that we're saying it's non-significant. Because it's non-significant, we do, we do not need to do the D or the effect size statistic. Um, because uh, we don't have statistical significance, so we're not going to have practical significance. But <clears throat> since we're using this as an example, let's live dangerously and assume that t had been significant. So what would we do? Well, the first step is calculating standard deviation for the entire two groups put together. So here's how we do that. We take one of the ends. And you're going to take the square root of it. And then you're going to take the standard error of the difference, that value, and multiply those together. And that's going to give you standard deviation, which you are going to need when you do step two, calculating the d statistic. So you're going to plug that number in right down here. And then you're going to take the difference between the means, which is either this minus this, or just the mean difference here, and put that on top. Drop any negatives, calculate your d value. And so if we were going to write that up, um, we would have something like this. So again, we're pretending it was significant. Then the next sentence would be, the effect of sorority membership on weight was large, comma, d is equal to such and such. 
So that's how you calculate D if you rejected the null hypothesis. Okay, so let's clean up a few details that I kind of glossed over. First off, where does this null hypothesis come from? How do we get to that? Well, let's recognize that we're comparing two sample means and both the standard deviation and mu are unknown. So two examples. Maybe you're going to compare the average aggressive level of 20 kids that play violent computer games versus 20 kids that don't. Maybe they play with kittens or um, cotton balls. And then second, you have a study, uh, which we were just talking about, impacting peer pressure and eating disorders. So maybe you're comparing the average weight of sorority women versus non-sorority women. So two groups, no population information. And how would you get to the null? Well, what we do is we think about, well, if there's no treatment effect, what would we expect? And so, in other words, we'd expect that the violent games had no difference um, in terms of the aggressive behaviors compared to the no-violent games, or that the weight of sorority women is equal to non-sorority women. For purposes of hypothesis testing, it's helpful to set it equal to zero. So we do a little algebra and subtract one from the other, and we end up with this minus this equals zero. But you can see it's the same thing mathematically. So short story is for hypothesis testing uh, with independent t-tests, we always have the null distribution set up as mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. And then there's a sampling distribution that's centered on this. In other words, sometimes you wouldn't be surprised if mu1 minus mu2 is a little greater than zero or it's a little less than zero and it still be the case that the null is true. In other words, it's not always going to exactly be zero. Okay, and then a uh, second detail to clean up is the formula. Let's just walk through that so that makes sense to you. Um, it should look very familiar to you. It's very similar to the one sample t-test. We got sample mean stuff, mu stuff, standard error stuff. So the difference here between the sample means is the actual difference you observe. That's the difference, say, between sorority women and non-sorority women. And then mu1 minus mu2, technically you could set it to something other than zero, but almost all the time you say, I don't think there's a difference between the groups. That's what your null is. So typically that drops out. Um, and then all you're left with is the difference between the sample means divided by the standard error of the difference. Because it's not just standard error of the mean now, it's the standard error of the difference between the means. So you notice you've got a subscript on a subscript, hyper subscript. So, um, and that on the bottom is the difference that you expected. So again, we always have this formulation where it's the difference we observed, the difference we expected, and we calculate this surprise index. Um, and you're going to expect to see the sample means differ somewhat because of sampling error, but you don't know. Um, you want to see how much it is relative to what you'd expect just due to chance. Okay, so let's do a second example here, and I'll ask some questions as we go through it. Um, so let's imagine that you have people sitting in a room, and they're going to do this eye chart thing, and you're going to compare people their scores for people that are sitting in the front versus the back and see how much difference there is um, and if we need to make adjustments and things based on people's vision. So your question is, do front row participants score significantly higher on a vision test than those in the back? And um, you're going to do an independent samples t-test. So first off, you've got to decide, is this the right setup for the data, or this, is A or B, and then which is the right hypothesis, and then what's the right degrees of freedom? So go ahead and hit pause and um, try to answer those questions, and I'll give you the answer. All right, what'd you say? Whoa, did you get that? It was kind of fast, wasn't it? Let's slow down a little. So A is the correct answer here. Um, you're dividing into the, the groups in the first column and the second column with the actual scores. Um, the null hypothesis is mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0. This is true, but this is how we actually state it. And then the degrees of freedom, it's that n1 plus n2 minus 2 thing. OK, and then let's look at the output. So here are the questions I have for you. Um, again, you can hit pause, and um, then we'll go on. I'll give you the right answers. But the first question, just to be clear, which line should you use in the table? I'm talking about this line or this line. How do you make that choice? OK, you can hit pause. All right. So the first one, which line to use in the table? Well, remember, we're checking to see if the variances are equal. And as long as this isn't significant, in other words, as long as this doesn't drop below um, 0.05, then we can use that first line, which is what we want to do. Notice how I have a few more degrees of freedom on the first line. Okay, 
Second question, I ask you, uh, how do you measure sampling error? That's the standard error of the difference. That's that new measure of standard error that we just learned about. And it would be, that's the symbols for it. And then it's that value right there, standard error of the difference. So again, that's the difference that you expect to see based just on sampling error. Can we reject the null hypothesis? No, we're foiled again. We're very close, 0.064, but we're not quite at significance. So how do you summarize the T? It'd be T with 27 degrees of freedom is equal to 1.931 comma not significant. Okay, and then how would you write that up? So I'll give you a little write-up space here, a little decalculation space. Why don't you hit pause and give that a whirl and um, start it again when you're ready. All right, what are the answers? Well, the hypothesis was not supported. You'd say performance for the front row participants, blah, did not significantly exceed that of back row participants, blah, and that's T with 27 degrees of freedom is equal to that. So again, it was in the direction we expected. The front row participants did score higher, but it didn't quite reach significance. Okay, and then how would you calculate D? Well, remember it's these two steps. First, you gotta get the N of one group, and I told you they're slightly different, but let's just assume they're both 14. And then you multiply that by the standard error of the difference, and you get this. Then you plug that in down here, in the 2.1702. And then on the top, you just have the difference between the sample means, drop any negatives, and you calculate that D value. So again, um, technically we don't have to do D, but this is how we'd do it if it had been significant. Okay, so some additional stuff that might be on um, a quiz if there are one in the near future. Um, what's the formula for independent samples t-test? Um, calculating the d-statistic uh, from the SPSS output. Oh, let me say one thing about this. So on the formula, we talk about the mu's oftentimes dropping out, but if I ask you for the formula, please include those. That That's the correct answer would include the mu's on the formula for the um, independent samples t-test. Okay, so calculating the D, uh, naming the symbol, the name and the symbol for standard error in the independent t-test, that's the standard error of the difference. Um, doing paragraph write-ups, the null hypothesis, the degrees of freedom for an independent t-test, and then also any questions about the one sample t-test would be fair game for a little quiz. All right, I hope you've enjoyed. We're gonna do the dependent t-test next.